Introduction Until a short time ago, it was believed that José Carlos María Tegui was born on June 14, 1895, in Lima. Recently, Guillermo Roerlian uncovered the fact that he was actually born in Maquegua in 1894. One his family belonged to the lower middle class. His father, Francisco Javier María Tegui, was a minor employee of the General Court of Accounts, his mother, Maria Amalia Olachera, was a mestiza from the countryside near Huacho. Of their four children, one girl, Amanda, died in infancy, so that José Carlos was left with a sister, Guillermina, and a brother, Julio Caesar, who later became a bookseller and publisher. His boyhood was spent in poverty. Perhaps for this reason, his father disappeared and his mother worked as a seamstress, or because of his health, always a sickly child. In 1902 he became hopelessly crippled in one leg, the Maria Tegui family moved to the village of Huacho. There, José Carlos entered a small school, but he never managed to go beyond a primary education. In 1909, at the age of 14, he began to work as a humble linotypist's assistant and proofreader for the Lima newspaper La Prensa. Maria Tegui at first went unnoticed in the printing room of the newspaper. He often had to go to the editor's homes to pick up their manuscripts. During this period he walked a great deal around the city, in spite of his lame leg. Sometimes he went by streetcar and was able to use those trips to read. He also wrote, having begun with the patriotic and religious poetry he composed at school. Little by little he rose in La Prensa. For a while he was assigned to classifying telegrams from the provinces, writing police and fire reports, and other secondary jobs. In 1914 the new journalist became known. He popularized his pen name, Juan Crony Kerr, by writing verses, theater, art and book reviews, stories, local news items, and occasional commentaries on national and international events. He also contributed in 1914 to the journal Mundo Limno, which was intended for an aristocratic public. He soon made many friends among his colleagues, of whom the best known at that time was Abraham Vald Lomar. Also in this group was Caesar Falcon, who was long to accompany Maria Tegui in his life and ideas. All these writers and others of his contemporaries approached journalism from an aesthetic point of view. In 1915 Maria Tegui became CEO director of the journal El Turf, here he tried to create a new type of literature, not only by means of light and ironic reports and social news, but also through poems and stories about horses. He stayed with El Turf until 1917. In 1915 and 1916 he also contributed to the journal Lulu, which was aimed mainly at a public of society girls and young intellectuals. In 1915 he was one of the initiators and founders of the Circle of Journalists, the first attempt made in Lima to gather together the men of his profession as a group. Maria Tegui's literary personality also found expression in the theater. January 12, 1916, marked the opening in Lima's Colon Theater of the scenic poem Los Tapados, which he wrote in collaboration with Julio Baudouin, Julio de la Paz, with music by La Rosa. Its theme is derived from the classic Spanish theater, its music is mediocre, it has no value as theater, its scenery is taken from a puppet show, but it has unquestionable literary merit, wrote an independent critic, Alfredo González Prada, in Colonita. The polished, elegant, flowing, graceful verse of Juan Crony Kerr, he added, is delicately modern in style within a classic savoir faire. Actually, the author was not trying to revive a classic style, but to imitate the poetic theater in verse cultivated in Spain in the first two decades of the 20th century by Eduardo Marquina and Francisco Villas Pesa, which was characterized by sonorous poetry, high flown sentiments, and a pseudo historic setting. Los Tapados, parroted as Las Potatas by Florentino Alcorta in his newspaper, El Mosquito, was not Maria Tegui's only theatrical venture. Toward the end of 1916, in collaboration with Abraham Vald Lomar, he finished writing the scenic poem La Mariscala. This work was never produced and only fragments of it, which appeared in El Tiempo, are known. 
Also in 1916, Maria Tegui announced his completion of a book of poetry, Tristeza, which was never published. His sonnets Los Salmos del Dolor, printed in the literary journal Colonita, were taken from that collection. The three sonnets were Plagaria del Canzancio, Colloquio Sentimental, and Insomnio. In one of them he describes himself as a child both somewhat mystic and somewhat sensual. In another, in reference to an unhappy love affair, he speaks of another shadow of sorrow in my life. 3. At that time an Ecuadorian writing on new Peruvian literature said that Maria Tegui was pagan and mystic, more poet than goldsmith, more ideologist than stylist. 4. A new daily newspaper, El Tiempo, published its first numbers in Lima on July 17, 1916, and it was dedicated to firmly opposing the conservative government of José Pardo. Some of its writers, among them Maria Tegui, had voluntarily left La Prensa, a newspaper supporting the Pardo regime. 5. He was extremely active on El Tiempo between 1916 and 1919. He wrote a daily section of humorous political comments entitled Voces, in which he went over the events of each day, parliamentary affairs and current gossip and rumors, real or imagined. It is very possible that his experience as author of Voces contributed to his skeptical attitude toward Peru's political life. His pseudonyms also appeared on other pages of El Tiempo under such sections as Lunes Literarios, where he printed some of his stories about horses. In Ecos Sociales, Juan Kroniker occasionally signed a gallant tale or commentary alluding to ladies of the aristocracy. Any incident, however painful or deplorable, could suggest a story to him, as with his Teoria del Incendio. In one of his Cartas AX he praised Manuel Ugart for his anti-imperialism, adding that our race is not one of apostles, that we are too apathetic, and that although contemporary champions of the Indians are not drawn and quartered like Tupac Amaru, they are ignored. And when in February, 1916, a jealous rival shot to death the poet Leonidas Uravi, Maria Tegui published in El Tiempo his Oration al Espiritu Immortal de Leonidas Uravi, which began with these words, I, who am your brother in pain and laughter, in faith and disbelief, in toil and reverie, in apathy and violence, in love and egotism, in sentiment and intellect, in the human and the divine, I invoke you, Uravi, in this hour of anguish. When the Pardo government founded the newspaper El Dia in 1917, Maria Tegui tried to create a humorous counterpoint, Ha Noche, but it lasted only a short time. Also in 1917 he received the Municipalidad de Lima Prize from the Circle of Journalists for his article La Processión Tradicional, which appeared in El Tiempo on April 12 and described Lima's popular religious procession in honor of Our Lord of Miracles. Always respectful of religion, he was inspired by a brief retreat in the monastery of the Discalced Friars to compose the sonnet Elegio de la Celda Ascetica. Nevertheless, Maria Tegui and other writer friends provoked an uproar when they went to the cemetery on the night of November 4 to watch Norca Rauskaya, an Argentine dancer, perform to the strains of Chopin's funeral march. The principals of this incident were jailed for a short period. Maria Tegui and his friends, in various Lima newspapers and before Congress, vehemently claimed that they had not meant any irreverence by their action, that the cemetery had been used for much more reprehensible purposes, that they were being attacked through ignorance, superstition or narrow-mindedness by critics who were themselves no models of moral rectitude, and that it had been simply an artistic performance. But Maria Tegui was gradually changing in spirit. On June 22, 1918,
companies. Viceroys, courtesans, adventurers, priests, lawyers, and soldiers were almost the only ones to come to Spanish America. Therefore, no real colonizing force developed in Peru. The population of Lima was made up of a small court, a bureaucracy, a few monasteries, officials of the Inquisition, merchants, domestic servants, and slaves. One furthermore, the Spanish pioneer had no outline of the economic evolution five talent for creating working groups. Instead of making use of the Indian, he seemed to be intent on exterminating him. And the colonizers could not create a solid and integrated economy by themselves. The very foundation of colonial organization was defective because it lacked demographic cement. There were not enough Spaniards and mestizos to develop the territorial wealth on a large scale. And since Negro slaves were imported to work on the coastal plantations, the elements and characteristics of a slave society were mixed into those of a feudal society. Only the Jesuits, with their systematic positivism, showed in Peru, as in other countries of America, some aptitude for economic creation. The latifundia assigned to them prospered and traces of their organization still survive. Remembering how skillfully the Jesuits in Paraguay made use of the natives' natural inclination to communal work, it is not surprising that this congregation of the sons of St. Ignatius of Loyola, as Unamuno called them, created centers of work and production on Peruvian soil, while nobles, lawyers, and priests enjoyed a luxurious and worldly life in Lima. Almost the sole interest of the colonizers was the mining of Peruvian gold and silver. I have referred more than once to the tendency of the Spaniards to settle in the lowlands and to how they feared and distrusted the Andes, of which they never really felt themselves masters. Undoubtedly, the Criollo towns that formed in the Sierra were the result of mining activities. The conquest of the Sierra would have been even more income. Slaves in case of hardship Gopti was mistaken in considering mere conquistadors to be colonizers. But his next observation merits reflection, the cult of the bullfight is an aspect of this love of entertainment and of this Catholicism of spectacle and form, it is natural that an emphasis on the purely decorative should be the ideal of the man in rags who puts on lordly airs and cannot follow either the Anglo-Saxon teachings of resolute and stubborn heroism or the French tradition of subtle skill. The Spanish ideal of an arrogant nobility borders on indolence and, therefore, finds its proper expression and symbol in the court. Plot had it not been for the Spaniards' greed for the precious metals buried deep within the Andes. These were the historical bases of the new Peruvian economy, of the colonial economy, colonial to its roots a process that is still evolving. Let us now examine the outlines of a second stage the stage in which a feudal economy gradually became a bourgeois economy, but without losing its colonial character within the world picture. The Economic Foundations of the Republic Like the first, the second stage of this economy derives from a political and military event. The first stage arose from the conquest. The second stage began with independence. But whereas the conquest was entirely responsible for the formation of our colonial economy, Independence appears to have been determined and dominated by the latter process. I have already had occasion, since my first Marxist attempt to ground Peruvian history in the study of economic events, to concern myself with the economic aspect of the War of Independence, and my reasoning was as follows, the ideas of the French Revolution and of the North American Constitution were favorably received in South America, where there already existed an emerging bourgeoisie which, because of its economic needs and interests, could and should have been infected by the revolutionary spirit of the European bourgeoisie. Spanish America could not have achieved its independence had it not commanded a heroic generation, sensitive to the emotional tenor of its time, able and willing to carry out a genuine revolution. From this point of view, independence takes on the appearance of a romantic adventure. But this does not contradict my thesis of an economic pattern underlying the revolution of liberation. The directors, caudillos, and ideologists of this revolution did not precede or transcend the economic premises and causes of this event. Intellectual and emotional circumstances did not precede economic circumstances. 
Spain's policy totally obstructed and thwarted the economic development of its colonies by not permitting them to trade with any other nation and by reserving to itself the privileges of the mother country to monopolize all commerce and business carried on in its dominions. The producing forces of the colonies naturally fought to shake off these fetters. If the emerging economy of the embryonic nations of America was to develop, it needed above all to be free of the rigid authority and medieval mentality of the King of Spain. The student of this period cannot help but see here that South America's independence movement was only too obviously inspired by the interests of the Criollo and even the Spanish population, rather than by the interests of the indigenous population. From the standpoint of world history, South America's independence was determined by the needs of the development of Western or, more precisely, capitalist civilization. The rise of capitalism had a much more decisive and profound, if less apparent and recognizable, influence on the evolution of independence than the philosophy and literature of the encyclopedists. The British Empire, fated to become the real and unsurpassed representative of the interests of capitalist civilization, was taking shape. In England, centre of liberalism and Protestantism, it was industry and machinery that prepared the way for capitalism, rather than that country's traditionally cited political philosophy and religious belief. Therefore, England with the clear sense of destiny and historic mission that was to gain it hegemony in capitalist civilization, played a leading role in South America's independence. Whereas the Prime Minister of France, the nation that some years earlier had given the world a great revolution, refused to recognize these young South American republics that could export not only their products but their revolutionary ideas, to Mr. Kenning, faithful in Tur. Preter an agent of England's interests, recognized them and thereby justified their right to separate from Spain and, in addition, to organize themselves democratically. And even before Mr. Kenning, the bankers of London no less timely and effective for being usurers had financed the formation of the new republic. The Spanish Empire sank into oblivion because it did not rest on military and political foundations and, especially, because it represented an outdated economy. Spain could supply its colonies only with priests, lawyers, and nobles. Its colonies craved more practical and modern instruments and, consequently, turned to England's industrialists and bankers. Acting as agents of an empire created by a manufacturing and free trade economy, the new style colonizers wanted, in turn, to dominate these markets. The economic interests of the Spanish colonies and of the capitalist West coincided exactly, although, as often happens in history, neither of the parties concerned was aware of this fact. The new nations, following the same natural impulse that had led them to independence, dealt with the capital and industry of the West in order to obtain the elements and relations necessary to expand their economies. They began to send to the capitalist West the products of their soil and subsoil and to receive from it cloth, machinery, and a thousand industrial products. In this way, a continual and increasing trade was established between South America and Western civilization. The countries on the Atlantic naturally benefited most from this trade because of their proximity to Europe. Argentina and Brazil, especially, attracted great quantities of European capital and immigrants and the floods from the West left rich and homogeneous deposits that accelerated the changes by which the economy and culture. C.A., said Viscount Chateaubriand, its entire policy should be aimed at establishing monarchies instead of these republics that will send us their principles along with the products of their soil. Of these countries gradually acquired the function and structure of the European economy and culture. Their, liberal, bourgeois democracy could take root whereas in the rest of South America it was blocked by extensive and tenacious remains of feudalism. In this period, the general historical process in Peru entered a stage that differentiated and separated it from the historical process of other countries in South America. Because of geography, some countries would advance more rapidly than others. The independence that had united them in a common cause decreed that they should part to follow their individual destinies. Since European ships could reach Peru's ports only after